chapter six of pioneers of the old south by mary johnston this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six sir thomas dale in a rebuilded jamestown lord de la war of approved courage temper and experience held for a short interval dignified seigneurial sway while his restless associates had ventured far and wide sir george somers sailed back to the bermudas to gather a cargo of the wild swine of those woods but illness seized him there and he died among the beautiful islands that captain samuel argall who had traversed for the company the short road from the canaries took up smith's fallen mantle and carried on the work of exploration it was he who found and named for the lord governor delaware bay he went up the potomac and traded for corn rescued an english boy from the indians had brushes with the savages in the autumn back to england with a string of ships went that tried and tested seafarer christopher newport virginia wanted many things and chiefly that the virginia company should excuse defect and remember promise so gates sailed with newport to make true report and guide exertion six months passed and the lord governor himself fell ill and must home to england so away he too went and for seven years until his death ruled from that distance through a deputy governor de la war was a man of note and worth old privy counsellor of elizabeth and of james soldier in the low countries strong protestant and believer in england in america to-day his name is borne by a great river a great bay and by one of the united states in london the virginia company having listened to gates projected a fourth supply for the colony of those hundreds who had perished in virginia many had been true and intelligent men and again many perhaps had been hardly that but the virginia company was now determined to exercise for the future a discrimination it issued a broadside making known that it was sending a new supply of men and all necessary provision in a fleet of good ships under the conduct of sir thomas gates and sir thomas dale and that it was not intended any more to burden the action with vagrant and unnecessary persons but honest and industrious men as carpenters smiths coopers fishermen tanners shoemakers shipwrights brickmen gardeners husbandmen and labouring men of all sorts that shall be entertained for the voyage upon such terms as their quality and fitness shall deserve yet in spite of precautions some of the other sort continued to creep in with the sober and industrious master william crashaw in a sermon upon the virginia venture remarks that they who go be like for aught i see to those who are left behind even of all sorts better and worse this probably hits the mark the virginia company meant at last to have order in virginia to this effect a new office was created and a strong man was found to fill it gates remained de la war's deputy governor but sir thomas dale went as marshal of virginia the latter sailed in march sixteen eleven with three ships three hundred people twelve kine twenty goats and all things needful for the colony gates followed in may with other ships three hundred colonists and much cattle for the next few years dale becomes in effect ruler of virginia he did much for the colony and therefore in that far past that is not so distant either much for the united states a man of note and worth considering dale had seen many years of service in the low countries 
he was still in holland when the summons came to cross the ocean in the service of the virginia company on the recommendation of henry prince of wales the states-general of the united netherlands consented that captain thomas dale destined by the king of great britain to be employed in virginia in his majesty's service may absent himself from his company for the space of three years and that his said company shall remain meanwhile vacant to be resumed by him if he think proper this man had a soldier's way with him and an iron will for five years in virginia he exhibited a certain stern efficiency which was perhaps the best support and medicine that could have been devised at the end of that time leaving virginia he did not return to the dutch service but became admiral of the fleet of the english east india company thus passing from one huge historic mercantile company to another with six ships he sailed for india near java the english and the dutch having chosen to quarrel he had with a dutch fleet a cruel bloody fight later when peace was restored the east india company would have given him command of an allied fleet of english and dutch ships the objective being trade along the coast of malabar and an attempt to open commerce with the chinese but sir thomas dale was opening commerce with a vaster hidden land for at masulipatam he died whose valour says his epitaph having shined in the western was set in the eastern india but now in may time of sixteen eleven dale was in virginian waters by this day beside the main settlement of jamestown there were at cape henry and point comfort small forts garrisoned with meagre companies of men dale made pause at these setting matters in order and then proceeding up the river he came to jamestown and found the people gathered to receive him presently he writes home to the company a letter that gives a view of the place and its needs any number of things must be done requiring continuous and hard work as namely the reparation of the falling church and so of the storehouse a stable for our horses a munition house a powder house a new well for the amending of the most unwholesome water which the old afforded brick to be made a sturgeon house a blockhouse to be raised on the north side of our back river to prevent the indians from killing our cattle a house to be set up to lodge our cattle in the winter and hay to be appointed in his due time to be made a smith's forge to be perfected cask for our sturgeons to be made and besides private gardens for each man common gardens for hemp and flax and such other seeds and lastly a bridge to land our goods dry and safe upon for most of which i take present order dale would have agreed with dr watts that satan finds some mischief still for idle hands to do if we of the united states to-day will call to mind certain western small towns of some decades ago if we will review them as they are pictured in poem and novel and play we may receive as it were out of the tale of the eye an impression of some aspects of these western plantings of the seventeenth century the daredevil the bully the tenderfoot the gambler the gentleman desperado had their counterparts in virginia so had the cool indomitable sheriff and his dependable posse the friends generally of law and order dale may be viewed as the picturesque sheriff of this earlier age but it must be remembered that this virginia was of the seventeenth not of the nineteenth century and law had cruel and idiot faces as well as faces just and wise hitherto the colony possessed no written statutes the company now resolved to impose upon the wayward an iron restraint it fell to dale to enforce the regulations known as laws and orders divine politic and martial for the colony of virginia 
not english civil law simply but laws chiefly extracted out of the laws for governing the army in the low countries the first part of this code was compiled by william strachey the latter part is thought to have been the work of sir edward cecil sir thomas gates and dale himself approved and accepted by the virginia company ten years afterwards defending itself before a committee of parliament the company through its treasurer declared the necessity of such laws in some cases ad terrorem and in some to be truly executed seventeenth-century english law herself was terrible enough in all conscience but dale's laws went beyond offences ranged from failure to attend church and idleness to lese majeste the penalties were gross cruel whippings imprisonment barbarous puddings to death the high marshal held the unruly down with a high hand but other factors than this draconian code worked at last toward order in this english west dale was no small statesman and he played ferment against ferment into virginia now first came private ownership of land so much was given to each colonist and care of this booty became to each a preoccupation the company at home sent out more and more settlers and more and more of the industrious peace-loving sort by sixteen twelve the english in america numbered about eight hundred dale projected another town and chose for its site the great horseshoe bend in the river a few miles below the falls of the far west at a spot we now call dutch gap here dale laid out a town which he named henricus after the prince of wales and for its citizens he drafted from jamestown three hundred persons to him also are due bermuda and shirley hundreds and dale's gift over on the eastern shore as the company sent over more colonists there began to show up and down the james though at far intervals cabins and clearings made by white men set about with a stockade and at the river edge a rude landing and a fastened boat the restless search for mines of gold and silver now slackened instead eyes turned for wealth to the kingdom of the plant and tree and to fur trade and fisheries those ships that brought colonists were in every instance expected to return to england laden with the commodities of virginia at first cargoes of precious ores were looked for these failing the company must take from virginia what lay at hand and what might be suited to english needs in sixteen ten the company issued a paper of instructions upon this subject of virginia commodities the daughter was expected to send to the mother country sassafras root bayberries pacoon sarsaparilla walnut chestnut and chinquapin oil wine silk grass beaver cod beaver and otter skins clapboard of oak and walnut tar pitch turpentine and powdered sturgeon it might seem that virginia was headed to become a land of fishers of foresters and vine dressers perhaps even when the gold should be at last discovered of miners at home the colonizing merchants and statesmen looked for some such thing in return for what she laid it into ships virginia was to receive english-made goods and to an especial degree woollen goods a very liberal utterance of our english cloths into a main country described to be bigger than all europe there was to be direct trade country kind for country kind and no specie to be taken out of england the promoters at home doubtless conceived a hardy and simple transatlantic folk of their own kindred planters for their own needs steady consumers of the plainer sort of english wares steady gatherers in return of necessaries for which england otherwise must trade after a costly fashion with lands which were not always friendly a simple sturdy laborious virginia white men and indians if this was their dream reality was soon to modify it a new commodity 
of unsuspected commercial value began now to be grown in garden plots along the james the weed par excellence tobacco that john rolfe who had been shipwrecked on the sea adventure was now a planter in virginia his child bermuda had died in infancy and his wife soon after their coming to jamestown rolfe remained a young man a good citizen and a christian and he loved tobacco on that trivial fact hinges an important chapter in the economic history of america in sixteen twelve rolfe planted tobacco in his own garden experimented with its culture and prophesied that the virginian weed would rank with the best spanish it was now a shorter plant smaller leafed and smaller flowered but time and skilful gardening would improve it england had known tobacco for thirty years owing its introduction to raleigh at first merely amused by the new world rarity england was now by general use turning a luxury into a necessity more and more she received through dutch and spanish ships tobacco from the indies among the english adventurers to virginia some already knew the uses of the weed others soon learned from the indians tobacco was perhaps not indigenous to virginia but had probably come through southern tribes who in turn had gained it from those who knew it in its tropical habitat now however tobacco was grown by all virginia indians and was regarded as the great spirit's best gift in the final happy hunting ground kings werowances and priests enjoyed it for ever when in the time after the first landing the indians brought gifts to the adventurers as to beings from a superior sphere they offered tobacco as well as comestibles like deer meat and mulberries later in england and in virginia there was some suggestion that it might be cultivated among other commodities but the company not to be diverted from the paths to profits demanded from virginia necessities and not new-fangled luxuries nevertheless a little tobacco was sent over to england and then a little more and then a larger quantity in less than five years it had become a main export and from that time to this profoundly has it affected the life of virginia and indeed of the united states this then is the wide and general event with which john rolfe is connected but there is also a narrower personal happening that has pleased all these centuries indian difficulties yet abounded but dale administrator as well as man of mars wound his way skilfully through them all powhatan brooded to one side over there at werowocomoco captain samuel argall was again in virginia having brought over sixty-two colonists in his ship the treasurer a bold and restless man explorer no less than mariner he again went trading up the potomac and visited upon its banks the village of japa saws kinsman of powhatan here he found no less a personage than powhatan's daughter pocahontas an idea came into argall's active and somewhat unscrupulous brain he bribed japazaws with a mighty gleaming copper kettle and by that chief's connivance took pocahontas from the village above the potomac he brought her captive in his boat down the chesapeake to the mouth of the james and so up the river to jamestown here to be held hostage for an indian peace this was in sixteen thirteen pocahontas stayed by the james in the rude settler's town which may have seemed to the indian girl stately and wonderful enough here rolfe made her acquaintance here they talked together and here after some scruples on his part as to heatheness they were married he writes of her desire to be taught and instructed in the knowledge of god her capableness of understanding her aptness and willingness to receive any good impression and also the spiritual besides her own incitement stirring me up hereunto first she was baptized receiving the name rebecca and then she was married to rolfe in the flower deck church at jamestown powhatan was not there but he sent young chiefs her brothers in his place rolfe had lands and cabins thereupon up the river near henricus he called this place varina the best spanish tobacco being varinas 
here he and pocahontas dwelled together civilly and lovingly when two years had passed the couple went with their infant son upon a visit to england there court and town and country flocked to see the indian princess after a time she and rolfe would go back to virginia but at gravesend before their ship sailed she was stricken with smallpox and died making a religious and godly end and there at gravesend she is buried her son thomas rolfe who was brought up in england returned at last to virginia and lived out his life there with his wife and children to-day no small host of americans have for ancestress the daughter of powhatan in england and america the immediate effect of the marriage was really to procure an indian peace outlasting pocahontas's brief life in dale's years there rises above the english horizon the cloud of new france the old disaster haunted huguenot colony in florida was a thing of the past to be mourned for when the spaniard wiped it out for at that time england herself was not in america but now that she was established there with some hundreds of men in a virginia that stretched from spanish florida to nova scotia the french shadow seemed ominous and just in this farther region amid fir trees and snow upon the desolate bay of fundy the french for some years had been keeping the breath of life in a huddle of cabins named port royal more than this and later than the port royal building frenchmen jesuits at that were trying a settlement on an island now called mount desert off a coast now named maine the virginia company doubtless with some reference back to the king and privy council de la war gates the deputy governor and dale the high marshal appear to have been of one mind as to these french settlements up north there was still virginia in effect england hands off therefore all european people speaking with an un-english tongue now it happened about this time that captain samuel argall received a commission to go fishing and that he fished off that coast that is now the coast of maine and brought his ship to anchor by mount desert argall a swift and high-handed person fished on dry land he swept into his net the jesuits on mount desert set half of them in an open boat to meet with what ship they might and brought the other half captive to jamestown later he appeared before port royal where he burned the cabins slew the cattle and drove into the forest the settler frenchmen but port royal and the land about it called acadia though much hurt survived argall's fishing there was also in virginia in these days the shadow of spain in sixteen eleven the english had found upon the beach near point comfort three spaniards from a spanish caravel which as the englishmen had learned with alarm was fitted with a shallop necessary and proper to discover freshets rivers and creeks they took the three prisoner and applied for instructions to dale who held them to be spies and clapped them into prison at point comfort that dale's suspicions were correct is proved by a letter which the king of spain wrote in cipher to the spanish ambassador in london ordering him to confer with the king as to the liberty of three prisoners whom englishmen in virginia have captured the three are the alcade don diego de molino ensign marco antonio perez and francisco lembry an english pilot who by my orders went to reconnoitre those ports small wonder that dale was apprehensive what may be the danger of this unto us he wrote home who are here so few so weak and unfortified i refer me to your own honourable knowledge months pass and the english ambassador to spain writes from madrid that he is not hasty to advertise anything upon bare rumours which hath made me hitherto forbear to write what i had generally heard of their intents against virginia but now i have been advertised that without question they will speedily attempt against our plantation there and that it is a thing resolved of that ye king of spain must run any hazard with england rather than permit ye english to settle there whatsoever is attempted i conceive will be from ye havana rumours fly back and forth the next year sixteen thirteen the ambassador writes from madrid they have lately had several consultations about our plantation in virginia the resolution is that it must be removed but they think it fit to suspend the execution of it for that they are in hope that it will fall of itself the spanish hope seemed at this time 
not at all without foundation members of the virginia company had formed the somers islands company named for somers the admiral and had planted a small colony in bermuda where the sea adventure had been wrecked here were fair fertile islands without indians and without the diseases that seemed to rise no man knew how from the marshes along those lower reaches of the great river james in virginia young though it was the new plantation prospereth better than that of virginia and giveth greater encouragement to prosecute it in england there arose from some concerned the cry to give up virginia that has proved a project awry as gates was once about to remove thence every living man so truly they might be now removed to these more hopeful islands the spanish ambassador is found writing to the spanish king thus they are here discouraged on account of the heavy expenses they have incurred and the disappointment that there is no passage from there to the south sea nor mines of gold or silver this be it noted was before tobacco was discovered to be an economic treasure the elizabeth from london reached virginia in may sixteen thirteen it brought to the colony news of bermuda and incidentally of that new notion brewing in the mind of some of the company when the elizabeth after a month in virginia turned homeward she carried a vigorous letter from dale the high marshal to sir thomas smith treasurer of the company let me tell you all at home writes dale this one thing and i pray remember it if you give over this country and lose it you with your wisdoms will leap such a gudgeon as our state hath not done the like since they lost the kingdom of france be not galled with the clamorous report of base people believe caleb and joshua if the glory of god have no power with them and the conversion of these poor infidels yet let the rich mammons desire egg them on to inhabit these countries i protest to you by the faith of an honest man the more i range the country the more i admire it i have seen the best countries in europe i protest to you before the living god put them all together this country will be equivalent unto them if it be inhabited with good people if ever mother england seriously thought of moving virginia into bermuda the idea was now given over spain suspending the sword until virginia will fall of itself saw that sword rust away five years in all dale ruled virginia then personal and family matters calling he sailed away home to england to return no more soon his star having shined in the western was set in the eastern india at the helm in virginia he left george yardley an honest able man but in england what was known as the court party in the company managed to have chosen instead for de la war's deputy governor captain samuel argall it proved an unfortunate choice argall a capable and daring buccaneer fastened on virginia as on a spanish galleon for a year he ruled in his own interest plundering and terrorizing at last the outcry against him grew so loud that it had to be listened to across the atlantic lord de la war was sent out in person to deal with matters but died on the way and captain yardley now knighted and appointed governor was instructed to proceed against the incorrigible argall but argall had already departed to face his accusers in england End of chapter six chapter seven of pioneers of the old south by mary johnston this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven young virginia the choice of sir edwin sandys as treasurer of the virginia company in sixteen nineteen marks a turning point in the history of both company and colony at a moment when james i was aiming at absolute monarchy and was menacing parliament sandys and his party the liberals of the day turned the sessions of the company into a parliament where momentous questions of state and colonial policy were freely debated the liberal spirit of sandys cast a beam of light too across the atlantic when governor yardley stepped ashore at jamestown in mid-april he brought with him as the first fruits of the new regime no less a boon than the grant of a representative assembly there were to be in virginia subject to the company subject in its turn to the crown 
two supreme councils one of which was to consist of the governor and his councillors chosen by the company in england the other was to be elected by the colonists two representatives or burgesses from each distinct settlement council and house of burgesses were to constitute the upper and lower houses of the general assembly the whole had power to legislate upon virginian affairs within the bounds of the colony but the governor in virginia and the company in england must approve its acts a mighty hope in small was here hedged about with provisions curtailed and limited here nevertheless was an acorn out of which by natural growth and some mutation was to come popular government wide and deep the planting of this small seed of freedom here in sixteen nineteen upon the banks of the james in virginia is an event of prime importance on the thirtieth of july sixteen nineteen there was convened in the log church in jamestown the first true parliament or legislative assembly in america twenty-two burgesses sat hat on head in the body of the church with the governor and the council in the best seats master john pory the speaker faced the assembly clerk and sergeant-at-arms were at hand master buck the jamestown minister made the solemn opening prayer the political divisions of this virginia were cities plantations and hundreds the english population numbering now at least a thousand souls boroughs sending burgesses were james city charles city the city of henricus kecatan smith's hundred bleardier hundred martin's hundred martin brandon ward's plantation lawn's plantation and argall's gift this first assembly attended to indian questions agriculture and religion most notable is this year sixteen nineteen a year wrought of gold and iron john rolfe back in virginia though without his indian princess who now lies in english earth jots down and makes no comment upon what he has written about the last of august came in a dutchman of war that sold us twenty niggers no european state of that day fewer individuals disapproved of the african slave trade that dark continent made a general hunting ground england spain france the netherlands captured bought and sold slaves englishmen in virginia bought without qualm as englishmen in england bought without qualm the cargo of the dutch ship was a commonplace the only novelty was that it was the first shipload of africans brought to english america here by the same waters were the beginnings of popular government and the young upas tree of slavery a contradiction in terms was set to resolve itself a riddle for unborn generations of americans presently there happened another importation virginia under the new management had strongly revived ships bringing colonists were coming in hamlets were building fields were being planted up and down were to be found churches a college at henricus was projected so that indian children might be taught and converted from heathenists yet was the population almost wholly a doublet and breeches wearing population the children for whom the school was building were indian children the men sailing to virginia dreamed of a few years there and gathered wealth and then returned to england apparently it was the new treasurer sir edwin sandys who first grasped the essential principle of successful colonization virginia must be home to those we send wife and children made home sandys gathered ninety women poor maidens and widows young handsome and chaste who were willing to emigrate and in virginia become wives of settlers they sailed their passage money was paid by the men of their choice they married and home life began in virginia in due course of time appeared fair-haired children blue or gray of eye with all england behind them yet native-born virginians from the cradle colonists in number sailed now from england most ranks of society 
and most professions were represented many brought education means independent position other honest men chiefly young men with little in the purse came over under indentures bound for a specified term of years to settlers of larger means these indentured men are numerous and when they have worked out their indebtedness they will take up land of their own an old suggestion of dale's now for the first time bore fruit over the protest of the country party in the company there began to be sent each year out of the king's jails a number though not at any time a large number of men under conviction for various crimes this practice continued or at intervals was resumed for years but its consequences were not so dire perhaps as we might imagine the penal laws were execrably brutal and in the drag-net of the law might be found many merely unfortunate many perhaps finer than the law virginia thus was founded and established an english people moved through her forests crossed in boats her shining waters trod the lanes of hamlets builded of wood but after english fashions climate surrounding nature differed from old england and these and circumstance would work for variation but the stock was middlesex surrey devon and all the other shires of england scotchmen came also welshmen and perhaps as early as this a few irish and there were de la war's handful of poles and germans and several french vine dressers political and economic life was taking form that huge luxurious thick-leafed yellow-flowered crop alike comforting and extravagant that tobacco that was in much to mould manners and customs and ways of looking at things was beginning to grow abundantly in sixteen twenty forty thousand pounds of tobacco went from virginia to england two years later went sixty thousand pounds the best sold at two shillings the pound the inferior for eighteen pence the virginians dropped all thought of sassafras and clabbert tobacco only had any flavour of golconda at this time the rich soil composed of layer on layer of the decay of forests that had lived from old time was incredibly fertile as fast as trees could be felled and dragged away in went the tobacco fields must have labourers nor did these need to be especially intelligent bring in indentured men to work presently dream that ships english as well as dutch might oftener load in africa and sell in virginia to furnish the dark fields with dark workers in dale's time had begun the making over of land in fee simple in yardley's time every ancient colonist that is every man who had come to virginia before sixteen sixteen was given a goodly number of acres subject to a quit rent men of means and influence obtained great holdings ownership rental sale and purchase of the land began in virginia much as in older times it had begun in england only here in america where it seemed that the land could never be exhausted individual holdings were often of great acreage thus arose the virginia planter in yardsley's time john barclay established at falling creek the first iron works ever set up in english america there were by this time in virginia glass works a windmill iron works to till the soil remained the chief industry but the tobacco culture grew until it overshadowed the maize and wheat the peas and beans there were cattle and swine not a few horses poultry pigeons and peacocks in sixteen twenty one yardley desiring to be relieved was succeeded by sir francis wyatt in october the new governor came from england in the george and with him a goodly company among others is found george sandys brother of sir edwin this gentleman and scholar beneath virginia skies and with virginia trees and blossoms about him translated the metamorphoses of ovid and the first book of the aeneid both of which were published in london in sixteen twenty six he stands as the first purely literary man of the english new world but vigorous enough literature though the writers thereof regarded it as information only had from the first years emanated from virginia smith's true relation george percy's discourse strachey's true repertory of the rack and redemption of sir thomas gates 
and his history of travail into virginia britannia haymore's true discourse whitaker's good news other letters and reports had already flowered all with something of the strength and fragrance of elizabethan and early jacobean work for some years there had seemed peace with the indians doubtless members of the one race may have marauded and members of the other showed themselves high-handed impatient and unjust but the majority on each side appeared to have settled into a kind of amity indians came singly or in parties from their villages to the white men's settlements where they traded corn and venison and what not for the magic things the white man owned a number had obtained the white man's firearms unwisely sold or given the red seemed reconciled to the white's presence in the land the indian village and the indian tribal economy rested beside the english settlement church and laws doubtless a fragment of the population of england and a fragment of the english in virginia saw in a pearly dream the red man baptized clothed become christian and english at the least it seemed that friendliness and peace might continue in the spring of sixteen twenty two a concerted indian attack and massacre fell like a bolt from the blue up and down the james and upon the chesapeake everywhere on the same day indians bursting from the dark forest that was so close behind every cluster of log-houses attacked the colonists three hundred and forty-seven englishmen women and children were slain but jamestown and the plantations in its neighbourhood were warned in time the english rallied gathered force turned upon and beat back to the forest the indian who was now and for a long time to come their open foe there followed upon this horror not a day or a month but years of organized retaliation and systematic harrying in the end the great majority of the indians either fell or were pushed back toward the upper pamunkey the rappahannock the potomac and westward upon the great shelf or terrace of the earth that climbed to the fabled mountains and with this westward move there passed away that old vision of wholesale christianizing End of chapter 7chapter eight of pioneers of the old south by mary johnston this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight royal government in november sixteen twenty there sailed into a quiet harbor on the coast of what is now massachusetts a ship named the mayflower having on board one hundred and two english nonconformists men and women and with them a few children these latest colonists held a patent from the virginia company and have left in writing a statement of their object we having undertaken for the glory of god and advancement of the christian faith and honor of our king and country a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of virginia the mental reservation is of course where perchance we may serve god as we will in england there obtained in some quarters a suspicion that they meant to make a free popular state there free popular public good these are words that began in the second quarter of the seventeenth century to shine and ring king and people had reached the verge of a great struggle the virginia company was divided as were other groups into factions the court party and the country party found themselves distinctly opposed the great crowded meetings of the company sessions rang with their divisions upon policies small and large words and phrases comprehensive sonorous heavy with the future rose and rolled beneath the roof of their great hall there were heard amid warm discussion kingdom and colony spain netherlands france church and state papists and schismatics duties tithes excise petitions of grievances representation right of assembly several years earlier the king had cried choose the devil but not sir edwin sandys 
now he declared the company just a seminary to a seditious parliament all london resounded with the clash of parties and opinions last week the earl of warwick and the lord cavendish fell so foul at a virginia court that the lie passed and repassed the factions are grown so violent that guelphs and ghibellines were not more animated one against another believing that the company's sessions foreshadowed a seditious parliament james stuart set himself with obstinacy and some cunning to the company's undoing the court party gave the king aid and circumstances favoured the attempt captain nathaniel butler who had once been governor of the summers islands and had now returned to england by way of virginia published in london the unmasked face of our colony in virginia containing a savage attack upon every item of virginian administration the king's privy council summoned the company or rather the country party to answer these and other allegations southampton sandys and farrar answered with strength and cogency but the tide was running against them james appointed commissioners to search out what was wrong with virginia certain men were shipped to virginia to get evidence there as well as support from the virginia assembly in this attempt they signally failed then to england came a virginia member of the virginia council with long letters to king and privy council the sandys southampton administration had done more than well for virginia the letters were letters of appeal the colony hoped that the governor sent over might not have absolute authority but might be restrained to the consent of the council but above all they made it their most humble request that they might still retain the liberty of their general assemblies than which nothing could more conduce to the public satisfaction and public liberty in london another paper drawn by cavendish was given to king and privy council it answered many accusations and among others the statement that the government of the companies as it then stood was democratical and tumultuous and ought therefore to be altered and reduced into the hands of a few it is of interest to hear these men speak in the year sixteen twenty three in an england that was close to absolute monarchy to a king who with all his house stood out for personal rule however they owned that according to his majesty's institution their government had some show of a democratical form which was nevertheless in that case the most just and profitable and most conducive to the ends and effects aimed at thereby lastly they observed that the opposite faction cried out loudly against democracy and yet called for oligarchy which would as they conceived make the government neither of better form nor more monarchical but the dissolution of the virginia company was at hand in october sixteen twenty three the privy council stated that the king had taken into his princely consideration the distressed state of the colony of virginia occasioned as it seemed by the ill government of the company the remedy for the ill management lay in the reduction of the government into fewer hands his majesty had resolved therefore upon the withdrawal of the company's charter and the substitution with due regard for continuing and preserving the interest of all adventurers and private persons whatsoever of a new order of things the new order proved on examination to be the old order of rule by the crown would the company surrender the old charter and accept a new one so modelled the company through the country party strove to gain time they met with a succession of arbitrary measures and were finally forced to a decision they would not surrender their charter then a writ of quo warranto was issued 
trial before the king's bench followed and judgment was rendered against the company in the spring term of sixteen twenty four thus with clangor fell the famous virginia company that was one year the march of the next year james stuart king of england died that young henry who was prince of wales when the susan constant the good speed and the discovery sailed past a cape and named it for him cape henry also had died his younger brother charles for whom was named that other and opposite cape now ascended the throne as king charles the first of england in virginia no more general assemblies are held for four years king charles embarks upon personal rule sir francis wyatt a good governor is retained by commission and a council is appointed by the king no longer are affairs to be conducted after a fashion democratical and tumultuous orders are transmitted from england the governor assisted by the council will take into cognizance purely local needs and when he sees some occasion he will issue a proclamation wyatt recalled finally to england george yardley again who died in a year's time francis west that brother of lord de la war and an ancient planter these in quick succession sit in the governor's chair following them john pott doctor of medicine has his short term then the king sends out sir john harvey avaricious and arbitrary so haughty and furious to the council and the best gentlemen of the country says beverley that his tyranny grew at last insupportable the company previously and now the king had urged upon the virginians a diversified industry and agriculture but englishmen in virginia had the familiar emigrant idea of making their fortunes they had left england they had taken their lives in their hands they had suffered fevers indian attacks homesickness deprivation they had come to virginia to get rich now clapboards and sassafras pitch tar and pine trees for masts were making no fortune for virginia shippers how could they these few folk far off in america compete in products of the force with northern europe as to mines of gold and silver that first rich vision had proved a disheartening mirage they have great hopes that the mountains are very rich from the discovery of a silver mine made nineteen years ago at a place about four days journey from the falls of james river but they have not the means of transporting the ore so dissatisfied with some means of livelihood and disappointed in others the virginians turn to tobacco every year each planter grew more tobacco every year more ships were laden in sixteen twenty eight more than five hundred thousand pounds were sent to england for to england it must go and not elsewhere there it must struggle with the best spanish for a long time valued above the best virginian finally however james and after him charles agreed to exclude the spanish virginia and the summer's islands alone might import tobacco into england but offsetting this customs went up ruinously a great lump sum must go annually to the king the leaf must enter only at the port of london so forth and so on finally charles put forth his proposal to monopolize the industry giving virginia tobacco the english market but limiting its production to the amount which the government could sell advantageously such a policy required cooperation from the colonists the king therefore ordered the governor to grant a virginia assembly which in turn should dutifully enter into partnership with him upon his terms so the virginia assembly thus came back into history it made a humble answer in which for all its humility the king's proposal was declined the idea of the royal monopoly faded out and virginia continued on its own way the general assembly having once met seems of its own motion to have continued meeting the next year we find it in session at jamestown and resolving that we should go three several marches upon the indians at three several times of the year and also 
that there be an especial care taken by all commanders and others that the people do repair to their churches on the sabbath day and to see that the penalty of one pound of tobacco for every time of absence and fifty pounds for every month's absence be levied and the delinquents to pay the same about this time we read dr john pott late governor indicted arraigned and found guilty of stealing cattle thirteen jurors three whereof counsellors this day wholly spent in pleading next day in unnecessary disputation these were moving times in the little colony whose population may by now have been five thousand harvey the governor was rapacious the king at home autocratic meanwhile signs of change and of rest were not wanting in europe england was hastening toward revolution in germany the thirty years war was in mid-career france and italy were racked by strife over the world the peoples groaned under the strain of oppression in science too there was promise of revolution harvey not that governor harvey of virginia but a greater in england was writing upon the circulation of the blood galileo brooded over ideas of the movement of the earth kepler over celestial harmonies and solar rule descartes was laying the foundation of a new philosophy in the meantime far across the atlantic bands of virginians went out against the indians who might or might not god knows have put in a claim to be considered among the oppressed peoples in virginia the fat black tobacco fields steaming under a sun like the sun of spain called for and got more labor and still more labor every little sailing ship brought white workmen called servants consigned indentured apprenticed to many acred planters these in return for their passage money must serve laban for a term of years but then would receive rachel or at least leah in the shape of freedom and a small holding and provision with which to begin again their individual life if they were ambitious and energetic they might presently be able in turn to import labor for their own acres as yet in virginia there were few african slaves not more perhaps than a couple of hundred but whenever ships brought them they were greedily purchased in virginia as everywhere in time of change there arose anomalies side by side persisted a romantic devotion to the king and a determination to have popular assemblies a great sense of the rights of the white individual together with african slavery a practical easy-going debonair naturalism side by side with an established church penalizing alike papist puritan and atheist even so early as this the social tone was set that was to hold for many and many a year the suave climate was somehow to foster alike a sense of caste and good neighborliness class distinctions and republican ideas the towns were of the fewest and rudest little more than small palisaded hamlets built of frame or log poised near the water of the river james the genius of the land was for the plantation rather than the town the fair and large brick or frame planter's house of a later time had not yet risen but the system was well inaugurated that set a main or big house upon some fair site with cabins clustered near and all surrounded save on the river front with far-flung acres some planted with grain and the rest with tobacco up and down the river these estates were strung together by the rudest roads mere tracks through field and wood the cart was as yet the sole wheeled vehicle but the virginia planter a horseman in england brought over horses bred horses and early placed horsemanship in the catalogue of the necessary colonial virtues at this point however in a land of great and lesser rivers with a network of creeks the boat provided the chief means of communication behind all enveloping all still spread the illimitable forest the haunt of indians and innumerable game virginians were already preparing for an expansion to the north there was a man in virginia named william claiborne this individual able determined self-reliant energetic had come in as a young man with the title of surveyor-general for the company 
in the ship that brought sir francis wyatt just before the massacre of sixteen twenty two he had prospered and was now secretary of the province he held lands and was endowed with a bold adventurous temper and a genius for business in a few years he had established widespread trading relations with the indians he and the men whom he employed penetrated to the upper shores of chesapeake into the forest bordering potomac and susquehanna knives and hatchets beads trinkets and colored cloth were changed for rich furs and various articles that the indians could furnish the skins thus gathered claiborne shipped to london merchants and was like to grow wealthy from what his trading brought looking upon the future and contemplating barter on a princely scale he set to work and obtained exhaustive licenses from the immediate virginian authorities and at last from the king himself under these grants claiborne began to provide settlements for his numerous traders far up the chesapeake a hundred miles or so from point comfort he found an island that he liked and named it kent island here for his men he built cabins with gardens around them a mill and a church he was far from the river james and the mass of his fellows but he esteemed himself to be in virginia and upon his own land what came of claiborne's enterprise the sequel has to show End of chapter eight chapter nine of pioneers of the old south by mary johnston this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine maryland there now enters upon the scene in virginia a man of middle age not without experience in planting colonies by name george calvert first lord baltimore of flemish ancestry born in yorkshire scholar at oxford traveller clerk of the privy council a secretary of state under james member of the house of commons member of the virginia company he knew many of the ramifications of life a man of worth and weight he was placed by temperament and education upon the side of the court party and the crown in the growing contest over rights about the year sixteen twenty five under what influence is not known he had openly professed the roman catholic faith and that took courage in the seventeenth century in england some years before calvert had obtained from the crown a grant of a part of newfoundland had named it avalon and had built great hopes upon its settlement but the northern winter had worked against him he knew for he had resided there himself with his family in that harsh clime from the middle of october to the middle of may there is a sad fare of winter on all this land he is writing to king charles and he goes on to say i have had strong temptations to leave all proceedings in plantations but my inclination carrying me naturally to these kind of works i am determined to commit this place to fishermen that are able to encounter storms and hard weather and to remove myself with some forty persons to your majesty's dominion of virginia where if your majesty will please to grant me a precinct of land i shall endeavour to the utmost of my power to deserve it with his immediate following he thereupon does sail far southward in october sixteen twenty nine he comes in between the capes past point comfort and so up to jamestown to the embarrassment of that capital as will soon be evident here in church of england virginia was a popish recusant here was an old court party man one of james's commissioners a person of rank and prestige known for all his recusancy to be in favour with the present king here was the proprietary of avalon guest to be dissatisfied with his chilly holding on the scent perhaps of balmier easier things 
the assembly was in session when lord baltimore came to jamestown all arrivers in virginia must take the oath of supremacy the assembly proposed this to the visitor who as roman catholic could not take it and said as much but offered his own declaration of friendliness to the powers that were this was declined debate followed ending with a request from the assembly that the visitor depart from virginia some harshnesses of speech ensued but hospitality and the amenities fairly saved the situation one thomas tyndall was pilloried for giving my lord baltimore the lie and threatening to knock him down baltimore thereupon set sail but not perhaps until he had gained that knowledge of conditions which he desired in england he found the king willing to make him a large grant with no less powers than had clothed him in avalon territory should be taken from the old virginia it must be of unsettled land indians of course not counting baltimore first thought of the stretch south of the river james between virginia and spanish florida a fair land of woods and streams of good harbors and summer weather but suddenly william claiborne was found to be in london sent there by the virginians with representations in his pocket virginia was already settled and had the intention herself of expanding to the south baltimore the king and the privy council weighed the matter westward the blue mountains closed the prospect was the south sea just beyond their sunset slopes or was it much farther away over unknown lands than the first adventurers had guessed either way too rugged hardship marked the west east rolled the ocean north then it were well to step in before those hollanders about the mouth of the hudson should cast nets to the south baltimore accordingly asked for a grant north of the potomac he received a huge territory stretching over what is now maryland delaware and a part of pennsylvania the potomac from source to mouth with a line across chesapeake and the eastern shore to the ocean formed his southern frontier his northern was the fortieth parallel from the ocean across country to the due point above the springs of the potomac over this great expanse he became true and absolute lord and proprietary holding fealty to england but otherwise at liberty to rule in his own domain with every power of feudal duke or prince the king had his allegiance likewise a fifth part of gold or silver found within his lands all persons going to dwell in his palatinate were to have rights and liberties of englishmen but this aside he was lord paramount the new country received the name terra marii maryland for henrietta maria then queen of england here was a new land and a lord proprietor with kingly powers virginians seated on the james promptly petitioned king charles not to do them wrong by so dividing their portion of the earth but king and privy council answered only that virginia and maryland must assist each other on all occasions as becometh fellow-subjects william claiborne indeed continued with a determined voice to cry out that lands given to baltimore were not as had been claimed unsettled seeing that he himself had under patent a town on kent island and another at the mouth of the susquehanna baltimore was a reflective man a dreamer in the good sense of the term and religiously minded at the height of seeming good fortune he could write all things my lord in this world pass away they are but lent us till god please to call for them back again that we may not esteem anything our own or set our hearts upon anything but him alone who only remains for ever like his king baltimore could carry far his prerogative and privilege maintaining the while not a few degrees of inner freedom 
like all men here he was bound and here he was free baltimore's desire was for enlarging his majesty's empire and at the same time to provide in maryland a refuge for his fellow catholics these were now in england so disabled and limited that their status might fairly be called that of a persecuted people the mounting puritanism promised no improvement the king himself had no fierce antagonism to the old religion but it was beginning to be seen that charles and charles's realm were two different things a haven should be provided before the storm blackened further baltimore thus saw put into his hands a high and holy opportunity and made no doubt that it was god-given his charter indeed seemed to contemplate an established church for it gave to baltimore the patronage of all churches and chapels which were to be consecrated according to the ecclesiastical laws of our kingdom of england nevertheless no interpretation of the charter was to be made prejudicial to god's holy and true christian religion what was christian and what was prejudicial was fortunately for him left undefined no obstacles were placed before a catholic emigration baltimore had this idea and perhaps a still wider one a land mary's land where all christians might foregather brothers and sisters in one home religious tolerance practical separation of church and state that was a broad idea for his age a generous idea for a roman catholic of a time not so far removed from the mediaeval true wherever he went and whatever might be his own thought and feeling he would still have for overlord a protestant sovereign and the words of his charter forbade him to make laws repugnant to the laws of england but maryland was distant and wise management might do much catholics anglicans puritans dissidents and nonconformists of almost any physiognomy might come and be at home unpunished for variations in belief only the personal friendship of england's king and the tact and suave sagacity of the proprietary himself could have procured the signing of this charter since it was known as it was to all who cared to busy themselves with the matter that here was a catholic meaning to take other catholics together with other scarcely less abominable sectaries out of the reach of recusancy acts and religious pains and penalties to set them free in england in america and raising there a state on the novel basis of free religion perhaps to convert the heathen to all manner of errors and embark on mischiefs far too large for definition taking things as they were in the world remembering acts of the catholic church in the not distant past the ill-disposed might find some colour for the agitation which presently did arise baltimore was known to be in correspondence with english jesuits and it soon appeared that jesuit priests were to accompany the first colonists at that time the society of jesus loomed large both politically and educationally many may have thought that there threatened a rome in america but however that may have been there was small chance for any successful opposition to the charter since parliament had been dissolved by the king not to be summoned again for eleven years the privy council was subservient and as the sovereign was his friend baltimore saw the signing of the charter assured and began to gather together his first colonists then somewhat suddenly in april sixteen thirty two he sickened and died at the age of fifty-three his son cecil calvert second lord baltimore took up his father's work this young man likewise able and sagacious and at every step in his father's confidence could and did proceed even in detail according to what had been planned all his father's rights had descended to him in maryland he was proprietary with as ample power as ever a count palatine had enjoyed he took up the advantage and the burden 
the father's idea had been to go with his colonists to maryland and this it seems that the son also meant to do but now in london there deepened a clamour against such catholic enterprise once he were away lips would be at the king's ear and with england so restless in a turmoil of new thought it might even arise that king and privy council would find trouble in acting after their will good though that might be the second baltimore therefore remained in england to safeguard his charter and his interests the family of baltimore was an able one cecil calvert had two brothers leonard and george and these would go to maryland in his place leonard he made governor and lieutenant-general and appointed him counsellor ships were made ready the ark of three hundred tons and the dove of fifty the colonists went aboard at gravesend where these ships rode at anchor of the company a great number were protestants willing to take land if their condition were bettered so with catholics difficulties of many kinds kept them all long at the mouth of the thames but at last late in november sixteen thirty three the ark and the dove set sail touching at the isle of wight they took aboard two jesuit priests father white and father altham and a number of other colonists baltimore reported that the expedition consisted of two of my brothers with very near twenty other gentlemen of very good fashion and three hundred labouring men well provided in all things these ships with the first marylanders went by the old west indies sea route we find them resting at barbados then they swung to the north and in february sixteen thirty four came to point comfort in virginia here they took supplies being treated by sir john harvey who had received a letter from the king with courtesy and humanity without long tarrying for they were sick now for land of their own they sailed on up the great bay the chesapeake soon they reached the mouth of the potomac a river much greater than any of them save shipmasters and mariners had ever seen and into this turned the ark and the dove after a few leagues of sailing up the wide stream they came upon an islet covered with trees leafless for spring had hardly broken the ships dropped anchor the boats were lowered the people went ashore here the calverts claim maryland for our saviour and for our sovereign lord the king of england and here they heard mass st clement's they call the island but it was too small for home the ark was left at anchor while leonard calvert went exploring with the dove up the potomac some distance he went but at the last he wisely determined to choose for their first town a site nearer the sea the dove turned and came back to the ark and both sailed on down the stream from st clement's isle before long they came to the mouth of a tributary stream flowing in from the north the dove going forth again entered this river which presently the party named the river st george soon they came to a high bank with trees tinged with the foliage of advancing spring here upon this bank the english found an indian village and a small algonquin group in the course of extinction by their formidable iroquois neighbours the giant susquehannocks the white men landed bearing a store of hatchets jujaws and coloured cloth the first lord baltimore having had opportunity enough for observing savages had probably handed on to his sagacious sons his conclusions as to ways of dealing with the natives of the forest and the undeniable logic of events was at last teaching the english how to colonize englishmen on roanoke island englishmen on the banks of the james englishmen in that first new england colony had borne the weight of early inexperience and all the catalogue of woes that follow ignorance all these early colonists alike had been quickly entangled in strife with the people whom they found in the land first they fell on their knees and then on the aborigines but by now much water had passed the mill the thinking kind the wiser sort 
might perceive more things than one and among these the fact that savages had a sense of justice and would even fight against injustice real or fancied the calverts through their interpreter conferred with the inhabitants of this indian village would they sell lands where the white men might peaceably settle under their given word to deal in friendly wise with the red men many hatchets and axes and much cloth would be given in return to a sylvan people store of hatchets and axes had a value beyond many fields of the boundless earth the dove appeared before them too at the psychological moment they had just discussed removing bag and baggage from the proximity of the iroquois in the end these indians sold to the english their village huts their cleared and planted fields and miles of surrounding forest moreover they stayed long enough in friendship with the newcomers to teach them many things of value then they departed leaving with the english a clear title to as much land as they could handle at least for some time to come later with other indians as with these the calverts pursued a conciliatory policy they were aided by the fact that the susquehannocks to the north who might have given trouble were involved in war with yet more northerly tribes and could pay scant attention to the incoming white men but even so the calverts proved as william penn proved later that men may live at peace with men honestly and honourably even though hue of skin and plane of development differ now the ark joins the dove in the river st george the pieces of ordnance are fired the colonists disembark and on the twenty seventh of march sixteen thirty four the indian village now english becomes st mary's on the whole how advantageously are they placed there is peace with the indians huts lodges are already built fields already cleared or planted the site is high and healthful they have at first few dissensions among themselves nor are they entirely alone or isolated in the new world there is a new england to the north of them and a virginia to the south from the one they get in the autumn salted fish from the other store of swine and cattle famine and pestilence are far from them they build a fort and perhaps a stockade but there are none of the stealthy deaths given by arrow and tomahawk in the north nor are there any of the spanish alarms that terrified the south from the first they have with them women and children they know that their settlement is home soon other ships and colonists follow the ark and the dove to st mary's and the history of this middle colony is well begun in virginia meantime there was jealousy enough of the new colony taking as it did territory held to be virginian and renaming it not for the old independent protestant virgin queen but for a french catholic queen consort even settling it with believers in the mass and bringing in jesuits it was says a jamestown settler accounted a crime almost as heinous as treason to favour nay to speak well of that colony beside the virginian folk as a whole one man in particular william claiborne nursed an individual grievance he had it from governor calvert that he might dwell on in kent island trading from there but only under license from the lord proprietor and as an inhabitant of maryland not of virginia claiborne with the assembly at jamestown secretly on his side resisted this interference with his rights and as he continued to trade with a high hand he soon fell under suspicion of stirring up the indians against the marylanders at the time this quarrel rang loud through maryland and virginia and even echoed across the atlantic leonard calvert had a trading boat of claiborne's seized in the patuxent river thereupon claiborne's men with the shallop cockatrice in retaliation attacked maryland pinnaces and lost both their lives and their boat for several years maryland and kent island continued intermittently to make petty war on each other at last in sixteen thirty eight calvert took the island by main force and hanged for piracy a captain of claiborne's 
the maryland assembly brought the traitor under a bill of attainder and a little later in england the lords commissioners of foreign plantations formally awarded kent island to the lord proprietor thus defeated claiborne nursing his wrath moved down the bay to virginia End of chapter nine chapter ten of pioneers of the old south by mary johnston this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten church and kingdom virginia all this time with maryland a thorn in her side was wrestling with an autocratic governor john harvey this avaricious tyrant sowed the wind until in sixteen thirty five he was like to reap the whirlwind though he was the king's governor and in good odour in england where rested the overpower to which virginia must bow yet in this year virginia blew upon her courage until it was glowing and laid rude hands upon him we read an assembly to be called to receive complaints against sir john harvey on the petition of many inhabitants to meet seventh of may but before that month was come the council seizing opportunity acted for the whole immediately below the entry above quoted appears on the twenty eighth of april sixteen thirty five sir john harvey thrust out of his government and captain john west acts as governor till the king's pleasure known so virginia began her course as rebel against political evils it is of interest to note that nicholas martian one of the men found active against the governor was an ancestor of george washington harvey thrust out took first ship for england and there also sailed commissioners from the virginia assembly with a declaration of wrongs for the king's ear but when they came to england they found that the king's ear was for the governor whom he had given to the virginians and whom they with audacious disobedience had deposed back should go sir john harvey still governing virginia back without audience the so-called commissioners happy to escape a merited hanging again to jamestown sailed harvey in silence virginia received him and while he remained governor no assembly sat but having asserted his authority the king in a few years time was willing to recall his unwelcome representative so in sixteen thirty nine governor harvey vanishes from the scene and in comes the well-liked sir francis wyatt as governor for the second time for two years he remains and is then superseded by sir william berkeley a notable figure in virginia for many years to come the population was now perhaps ten thousand both english-born and virginians born of english parents a few hundred negroes moved in the tobacco fields more would be brought in and yet more and now above a million pounds of tobacco were going annually to england the century was predominantly one of inner and outer religious conflict what went on at home in england re-echoed in virginia the new governor was a dyed-in-the-wool cavalier utterly stubborn for king and church the assemblies likewise leaned that way as presumably did the mass of the people it was ordered in sixteen thirty one that there be a uniformity throughout this colony both in substance and circumstance to the canons and constitutions of the church of england as near as may be and that every person yield ready obedience unto them upon penalty of the pains and forfeitures in that case appointed and indeed the pains and forfeitures threatened were savage enough official virginia loyal to the established church was jealous and fearful of papistry and looked askance at puritanism it frowned upon these and upon agnosticisms atheisms pantheisms religious doubts and alterations in judgment upon anything in short that seemed to push a finger against church and kingdom 
yet in this virginia governed by sir william berkeley a gentleman more cavalier than the cavaliers more royalist than the king more churchly than the church there lived not a few puritans and dissidents going on as best they might with established church and fiery king's men certain parishes were predominantly puritan certain ministers were known to have leanings away from surplices and genuflections and to hold that archbishop laud was some kin to the pope in sixteen forty two to reinforce these ministers came three more from new england actively averse to conformity but governor and council and the majority of the burgesses will have none of that the assembly of sixteen forty three takes sharp action for the preservation of the purity of doctrine and unity of the church it is enacted that all ministers whatsoever which shall reside in the colony are to be conformable to the orders and constitutions of the church of england and the laws therein established and not otherwise to be admitted to teach or preach publicly or privately and that the governor and council do take care that all nonconformists upon notice of them shall be compelled to depart the colony with all convenience and so in consequence out of virginia to new england where independents were welcome or to maryland where any christian might dwell went these tainted ministers but there stayed behind puritan and nonconforming minds in the bodies of many parishioners they must hold their tongues indeed and outwardly conform but they watched lynx-eyed for their opportunity and a more favourable fortune having launched thunderbolts against schismatics of this sort berkeley himself active and powerful with the council almost wholly of his party and the house of burgesses dominantly so turned his attention to popish recusants of these there were few or none dwelling in virginia let them then not attempt to come from maryland the rulers of the colony legislated with vigour papists may not hold any public place all statutes against them shall be duly executed popish priests by chance or intent arriving within the bounds of virginia shall be given five days warning and if at the end of this time they are yet upon virginian soil action shall be brought against them berkeley sweeps with an impatient broom the kingdom is cared for not less than the church in virginia any and all persons coming into the colony by land and by sea shall have administered to them the oath of supremacy and allegiance which if any shall refuse to take the commander of the fort at point comfort shall commit him or them to prison foreigners in birth and tongue foreigners in thought must have found the place and time narrow indeed on the eve of civil war there arose on the part of some in england a project to revive and restore the old virginia company by procuring from charles now deep in troubles of his own a renewal of the old letters patent and the transference of the direct government of the colony into the hands of a reorganized and vast corporation virginia which a score of years before had defended the company now protested vigorously and with regard to the long view of things it may be thought wisely the project died a natural death the petition sent from virginia shows plainly enough the pen of berkeley there are a multitude of reasons why virginia should not pass from king to company among which these are worthy of note we may not admit of so unnatural a distance as a company will interpose between his sacred majesty and us his subjects from whose immediate protection we have received so many royal favours and gracious blessings for by such admissions we shall degenerate from the condition of our birth being naturalised under a monarchical government and not a popular and tumultuary government depending upon the greatest number of votes of persons of several humours and dispositions when this paper reached england it came to a country at civil war the long parliament was in session stafford had been beheaded the star chamber swept away the grand remonstrance presented on edge hill bloomed flowers that would soon be trampled by rupert's cavalry in virginia the assembly 
took notice of these unkind differences now in england and provided by tithing for the governor's pension and allowance which were for the present suspended and endangered by the troubles at home that the forces banded against the lord's anointed would prove victorious must at this time have appeared preposterously unlikely to the fiery governor and the ultra loyal virginia whom he led the puritans and independents in virginia estimated a little earlier at a thousand strong and now for all the acts against them probably stronger yet were to be found chiefly in the parishes of isle of wight and nansman but had representatives from the falls to the eastern shore what these virginians thought of the unkind differences does not appear in the record but probably there was thought enough and secret hopes in sixteen forty four the year of marston moor virginia too saw battle and sudden and bloody death that opekanoff who had succeeded powhatan was now one hundred years old hardly able to walk or to see dwelling harmlessly in a village upon the upper pamunkey all the indians were broken and dispersed serious danger was not to be thought of then of a sudden the flame leaped again there fell from the blue sky a massacre directed against the outlying plantations three hundred men women and children were killed by the indians with fury the white men attacked in return they sent bodies of horse into the untouched western forests they chased and slew without mercy in sixteen forty six opekanoff brought a prisoner to jamestown and in his long tale of years by a shot from one of his keepers the indians were beaten and lacking such another leader made no more organized and general attacks but for long years a kind of border warfare still went on even maryland tolerant and just as was the calvert policy did not altogether escape indian troubles she had to contend with no such able chief as opekanoff and she suffered no sweeping massacres but after the first idyllic year or so there set in a small constant friction so fast did the maryland colonists arrive that soon there was pressure of population beyond those first purchased bounds the more thoughtful among the indians may well have taken alarm lest their villages and hunting grounds might not endure these inroads ere long the english in maryland were placing sentinels over fields where men worked and providing penalties for those who sold the savages firearms but at no time did young maryland suffer the indian woes that had vexed young virginia nor did maryland escape the clash of interests which beset the beginnings of representative assemblies in all proprietary provinces the second like the first lord baltimore was a believer in kings and aristocracies in a natural division of human society into masters and men his effort was to plant intact in maryland a feudal order he would be palatine the king his suzerain in maryland the great planters in effect his barons should live upon estates manorial in size and with manorial rights the laboring men the impecunious adventurers whom these greater adventurers brought out would form a tenantry the lord proprietary's men's men it is true that according to charter provision was made for an assembly here were to sit freemen of the province that is to say all white males who were not in the position of indentured servants but with the proprietary and not with the assembly would rest primarily the law-making power the lord proprietor would propose legislation and the freemen of the country would debate in a measure advise represent act as consultants and finally confirm baltimore was prepared to be a benevolent lord wise fatherly in sixteen thirty five met the first assembly leonard calvert and his council sitting with the burgesses and this gathering of freemen proceeded to inaugurate legislation there was passed a string of enactments which presumably dealt with immediate wants at st mary's and which the assembly recognized must have the lord proprietary's assent a copy was therefore sent by the first ship to leave so long were the voyages and so slow the procedure in england that it was sixteen thirty seven before baltimore's veto upon the assembly's laws reached maryland it would seem that he did not disapprove so much of the laws themselves 
as of the bold initiative of the assembly for he at once sent over twelve bills of his own drafting leonard calvert was instructed to bring all freemen together in assembly and present for their acceptance the substituted legislation early in sixteen thirty eight this maryland assembly met the governor put before it for adoption the proprietary's laws the vote was taken governor and some others were for the remainder of the assembly unanimously against the proposed legislation there followed a year or two of struggle over this question but in the end the proprietary in effect acknowledged defeat the colonists through their assembly might therefore propose laws to meet their exigencies and governor calvert acting for his brother should approve or veto according to need when civil war between king and parliament broke out in england sentiment in maryland as in virginia inclined toward the king but that puritan nonconformist and republican element that was in both colonies might be expected to gain if at home in england the parliamentary party gained a royal governor or a lord proprietary's governor might alike be perplexed by the political turmoil in the mother country leonard calvert felt the need of first-hand consultation with his brother leaving giles brent in his place he sailed for england talked there with baltimore himself perplexed and filled with foreboding and returned to maryland not greatly wiser than when he went maryland was soon convulsed by disorders which in many ways reflected the unsettled conditions in england a london ship commanded by richard ingle a puritan and a staunch upholder of the cause of parliament arrived before st mary's where he gave great offence by his blatant remarks about the king and rupert that prince rogue though he was promptly arrested on the charge of treason he managed to escape and soon left the loyal colony far astern in the meantime leonard calvert had come back to maryland where he found confusion and a growing heat and faction and side-taking of a bitter sort to add to the turmoil william claiborne among whose dominant traits was an inability to recognize defeat was making attempts upon kent island calvert was not long at st mary's ere ingle sailed in again with letters of mark from the long parliament ingle and his men landed and quickly found out the protestant moiety of the colonists their father an actual insurrection the marylanders joining with ingle and much aided by claiborne who now retook kent island the insurgents then captured st mary's and forced the governor to flee to virginia for two years ingle ruled and plundered sequestrating goods of the proprietary's adherents and deporting in irons jesuit priests at the end of this time calvert reappeared and behind him a troop gathered in virginia now it was ingle's turn to flee regaining his ship he made sail for england and maryland settled down again to the ancient order the governor then reduced kent island claiborne again defeated retired to virginia whence he sailed for england in sixteen forty seven leonard calvert died until the proprietary's will should be known thomas green acted as governor over in england lord baltimore stood at the parting of the ways the king's cause had a hopeless look roundhead and parliament were making way in a mighty tide baltimore was marked for a royalist and a catholic if the tide rose farther he might lose maryland a sagacious mind he proceeded to do all that he could short of denying his every belief to placate his enemies he appointed as governor of maryland william stone a puritan and into the council numbering five members he put three puritans on the other hand the interests of his maryland catholics must not be endangered he required of the new governor not to molest any person professing to believe in jesus christ and in particular any roman catholic in this way he thought that right and left he might provide against persecution under these complex influences the maryland assembly passed in sixteen forty nine an act concerning religion it reveals upon the one hand christendom's mercilessness toward the freethinker in which mercilessness whether through conviction or policy baltimore acquiesced and on the other hand that aspiration toward friendship within the christian fold which is even yet hardly more than a pious wish and which in the seventeenth century could have been felt by very few to baltimore and the assembly of maryland belongs 
not the glory of inaugurating an era of wide toleration for men and women of all beliefs or disbeliefs whether christian or not but the real though lesser glory of establishing entire toleration among the divisions within the christian circle itself according to the act whatsoever person or persons within this province and the islands thereunto belonging shall from henceforth blaspheme god that is curse him or deny our saviour jesus christ to be the son of god or shall deny the holy trinity or the godhead of any of the said three persons of the trinity or the unity of the godhead or shall use or utter any reproachful speeches words or language concerning the said holy trinity or any of the said three persons thereof shall be punished with death and confiscation or forfeiture of all his or her lands and goods to the lord proprietary and his heirs whatsoever person or persons shall from henceforth use or utter any reproachful words or speeches concerning the blessed virgin mary the mother of our saviour or the holy apostles or evangelists or any of them shall in such case for the first offence forfeit to the said lord proprietary and his heirs the sum of five pounds sterling whatsoever person shall henceforth upon any occasion declare call or denominate any person or persons whatsoever inhabiting residing trafficking trading or commercing within this province or within any of the ports harbours creeks or havens to the same belonging an heretic schismatic idolater puritan independent presbyterian popish priest jesuit jesuited papist lutheran calvinist anabaptist brownist antinomian barrowist roundhead separatist or any other name or term in a reproachful manner relating to matter of religion shall for every such offence forfeit the sum of ten shillings sterling whereas the enforcing of the conscience in matters of religion hath frequently fallen out to be of dangerous consequence in those commonwealths where it hath been practised be it therefore also by the lord proprietary with the advice and consent of this assembly ordained and enacted that no person or persons whatsoever within this province professing to believe in jesus christ shall from henceforth be any ways troubled molested or discountenanced for or in respect of his or her religion nor in the free exercise thereof nor any way compelled to the belief or exercise of any other religion against his or her consent so as they be not unfaithful to the lord proprietary or molest or conspire against the civil government End of chapter 10